you. But for those of you for whom this is your first time, our group is called FinTech Devs and PMs. Feel free to tweet under the uh, hashtag here. And what we like to do is we like to talk about uh, FinTech and also product in FinTech. So we got started back in 2016. It was something I didn't really intend to do. I just started going to some meetups, started helping someone else run a meetup. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll start my own meetup. And so we started about two years ago, and now we have over 1,500 members, I think actually over 1,600 as of today, and we've had 35 different FinTech companies present. Usually what we do is we have uh, some kind of theme that loosely orients the evening, and we'll either, like we're doing tonight, have just one person speak for the hour, or have three different companies uh, talk about something around that theme. So that's what we're generally up to. We run a meetup every month, so we hope you'll come back, check us out in the future. And specifically tonight, who we have with us is Adam Nash. So I'm sure many of you know Adam Nash. He started off as an engineer and has actually done a lot of work across product for his career as VP of product at LinkedIn. And then how many of you are probably most familiar with him is as the former CEO of Wealthfront. Right now, he's also serving on the boards of Acorns, advising some other FinTech companies, and uh, spending time as an entrepreneur and residence at Greylock. So he has a whole Breadth of experience across engineering, product, technology, fintech, all that sort of stuff. So I'm very excited to introduce Adam Nash and have him talk about kind of hard one product lessons uh, that he's learned over his career. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it on over to Adam. Great. Bear with me one second. We'll do, do the old laptop the swap. Laptop swap. Yeah. I go back and forth, I shaved him up there. So anyone who was expecting the bearded guy, I apologize. Uh, it'll be back, I'm sure, in the fall. Uh, and second, um, if anyone didn't warn you in advance, I'm not actually that funny a speaker. I'm like at best slightly amusing, like like uh, a beer or two in funny kind of thing, which of course is perfect for the meetup. So uh, anyway, if you hear anything that resembles a joke in this talk, um, just lean into it and laugh. <laughs> right, it's okay. Pity's fine. Laughs are all good. Um, but anyway, this talk is actually a very meaningful one for me because um, it was never intended to be a public-facing talk. Um, when I left LinkedIn, um, uh, our, there became a tradition at LinkedIn started by uh, our chief scientist at the time, DJ Patil, uh, of doing kind of a last lecture, which is very, a good tradition in academia. And so um, as some of the early folks at LinkedIn kind of peeled off and went to do new things, it was a, what did we learn during this time? And so I get to talk a bit about all the lessons I've learned in product, um, uh, both previous to LinkedIn and then. And, and what happened is when I joined Greylock, um, it turned out that there were a lot of portfolio companies that wanted to hear the talk too. And so at this point, I've now done it um, probably to two or three dozen different companies, uh, um, even traveling around um, for companies that have gone public. So anyway, it's near and dear to my heart partially because creating great product um, and, and being a great product manager, a great product leader, is something that I think that not enough people think deeply about, um, and it affects every function, right? It, it's not just for product managers, it's for engineers, it's for designers, um, it's for people in marketing and sales. Um, this role of product is a very difficult one to wrap your heads around, especially if you come from another industry, or you haven't seen it done over and over again at different companies, because it varies at every company. So I did my best to, to boil this down. Um, I like to start off usually with a quote from a famous business leader, you know, someone that we can all look up to and respect, like a 25-foot robot, alien robot. No? Not so big dolphin is fine. I guess <laughs> movies aren't that good. Anyway, um, the reason I put this up is because actually product is one of these roles that most company gets reinvented all the time. I can't tell you how many startups actually begin without someone in the product role. Um, and very quickly it, it re-evolves. Right? You know, either, either an engineer who's particularly good on the strategy and business side um, starts taking more and more of that role, 
or someone who's on the business side who's really good at the analytics and, and, and understands technology takes on that role. But that need to kind of pull together all the different aspects of the business, whether it's the strategy, the people, uh, the design, the customer facing features, um, or the technology, um, something has to pull it together. And like everything important in business, if something's important, very soon you want to put someone on that job and make it their full time job. And so that's why product re evolves. Anyway, um, you know, this talk in some ways began um, with a conversation I had uh, with Reid Hoffman back in 2007. So I know it's like a thousand years ago, but back in 2007, um, Web 2.0 was just beginning to really push out and people were actually talking about the consumer web again, um, not looking back towards the bubble bursting. Um, and it was very fashionable to, to, to say that product shouldn't exist, right? So there was a, a little bit of mentality then that like if you just, you're an engineer, you're writing code, you get customer feedback immediately on the web, they tell you what to do, you iterate on the code, the next day it's updated, um, why would you want someone in the middle of that, right? Why would you want someone in the role of product management? And so Reed, of course, being a big believer in product and I, um, I got introduced by John Lilly, who's now a partner at Greylock, um, and we met at a Hobie's um, in Mountain View. Um, it's actually, I don't know if you guys have been to Hobie's, but like, some of them are good, like this is the worst one. Like, it's a terrible one in Mountain View on Alma. I don't know why it's still there, but it, it's terrible. But we were supposed to do an hour breakfast. We ended up talking for four hours about what was the role for product in a Web 2.0 world, right? With social and viral features, um, with an active, engaged community, with open source. Um, and we both agreed that we thought product needed to evolve, but it was still very, very important. Um, in the process, Reed also convinced me to not take my offer from VMware and go to LinkedIn. Uh, and so there you go. Um, he's very good at that, recruiting. Um, anyway, I, I tend to believe that people join companies in software, in particular in startups, because they believe that this time we can do it better. And that's why there's an evergreen supply of companies, because we never seem to be happy with the way we build software. We're always like, oh, the next time I do this, we'll do this. And that applies to product as well. And so these basically summarize the top lessons that I've had. Um, and I've iterated them since I left LinkedIn. So there's a couple new ones in here. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end as well. Uh, so the first one may seem a little boring. Um, but it's been my experience that in many, many companies, the number one question from people who don't work in product is, what do product managers exactly do? What are they held accountable for, right? You know, it, it's pretty obvious what you do when you're when you're an engineer, right? Architecture, implementation, operations. And it's also pretty obvious what you do when you're a designer, right? Um, for some reason, um, most companies are reticent to actually define the role of product, which I think actually leads to people distrusting what they're actually accountable for, responsible for, or that it's a job at all. Um, and so I've kind of narrowed it down to these three things, uh, and there's some variety to it, but fundamentally. I think good product managers have to elevate themselves and product leaders to doing all three of these things if they want the company to be successful. So the first thing turns out to be strategy, right? Clear linear order. Um, you'd think that this was taken care of, but it's amazing how even at small startups, the whole team agrees on about 80% of the strategy, but not that last 20%. And that shouldn't matter so much except when you're a really small team and you're trying to move quickly, that last 20% can easily eat up almost all your time and arguments about what to prioritize. And so I see companies dive in to building a product role because they need prioritization, because they need execution. And yet the real fundamental problem is that not everyone agrees on the strategy. So um, even though um, I'm sure that some of my business school professors and advisors would be embarrassed to have me define strategy this way, I really think that for most software companies it's simple. Everyone needs to know what game you're playing, right? Whether it's with competitors, um, how you're playing that game, um, and how to keep score, which is where metrics come in. If you're missing one of those two things, the other doesn't help you, right? Everyone knowing a strategy, but not having metrics to track whether you're winning or losing um, is a real problem. And having metrics, no matter if you have two metrics or 200, without actually then backing into a strategy that makes sense, won't help you either. You'll get optimization for the metrics. So, First and foremost, whether you're a founder, whether you're the head of product, CTO, you know, whatever the role is, you need to make sure that the team that's building the product understands what game you're playing and how to keep score. Once you know that, prioritization becomes much easier. Right? You have metrics you agree on, you have a strategy, you can have substantive debate about that. Even the hardest debates that happen in software companies, which is, I know this is a good idea, but do we do this right now? 
we were only going to do three things, do we do this now, or is it something that we'll do eventually as we become bigger and more successful? And those are the hardest discussions. Um, and then lastly, execution. Right? Once you know what game you're playing and how to keep score, once you have a prioritized list of things to do, then it just becomes about execution. And the fact is, in software, it's unpredictable. You don't know where the potholes are going to be, what extra parts of your process needs to happen. Um, you have to cover weaknesses on the team. Um, and a good product leader steps into all of those gaps. Right? And we all know this, right? If, if, if you don't have enough people testing on quality, who jumps in and helps or should? Usually the product manager. If not enough customers have been talked to about the product, they'll jump in and do it. Um, I mean, literally almost anything um, is fair game because in the end, product is one of the few roles where they're actually judged based on the outcome. Um, and there's no, there's no E for effort. There's no, well, you get a gold star for following the process. For better or for worse, product managers are usually held accountable for the actual results of the product release, but which puts an extra incentive on them to cover those gaps. Um, and that gets me to my second point, the second big lesson. Um, and this is something that I really only learned as I became a manager of other product managers and eventually an executive running teams, um, was that it was almost impossible to actually have a product manager be successful at the company if they didn't actually show results within a period of time, right? Um, unlike other roles where there'd be some onboarding, some learning, and there were very tangible results that you could point to, like I said, it doesn't take long for an engineer at a company to kind of demonstrate their efficacy in working on the technical problems, working on the code base, working in operations, etc. Same thing for a designer. Product is a little bit different. There isn't anything that tangible, uh, and as lovely as a well-written product specification might be, um, that doesn't seem to cut the mustard with most folks. What I found was that if a product manager didn't help a team launch a product that actually moved the needle on the business in some predicted way within at least three to six months, um, it was like the coach on a team. Um, they never got the credibility. Um, and so you know, the analogy I would give here is that of being a coach, not because that defines the product manager role, but it turns out people will only follow process or roles and responsibilities for so long. Right? So when a team gets a new coach and the coach says, hey, we're going to run new plays, we're going to do things differently this year, most players will follow that for a period of time and give it a shot because the team holds together. But once you start playing games, you start losing games. At some point, what matters is we're losing a lot of games. Right? And, and whether it's internally or whether it's from the outside, um, the, the coach tends to lose the credibility with the team. And I saw the same impact with product managers and product leaders um, it's one of the reasons that I actually got to the point where actually I specifically made it part of the onboarding process. That my goal for product managers at LinkedIn was to make sure that I had a good idea that at least one of the product features they were assigned to in their first few months was one that we had a high estimation would see some success in the field. That's how hard it was to turn around. Um, some people think this is unfair, right? Some people see product as a process driven role. Right? Well, if we get the whole team together, we win as a team, we lose as a team, um, why would it be one unique role that's accountable for the results? Um, and the answer is actually that that accountability matters for that last 5% of effort. Right? It forces someone into the role of thinking through, is there something we've forgotten? Is there some gap here that we're unsure about? Is there some risk that we should all be upfront about going into? It doesn't mean you take out risk when you launch. I mean, this is software. I mean, in the startup world, you, you, you launch into hundreds of different risks. Um, but having someone very focused on what's the purpose of this experiment, what are we going to learn from it? If it works, what did we learn? If it doesn't work, what did we learn? Um, turns out to only happen, in my experience, um, when people have direct accountability for the results. Um, and so it's, it's a hard role, but like a lot of leadership roles, it involves a lot of responsibility uh, without a lot of authority. Um, and actually, I can tell you, as someone who uh, has been CEO of a company, etc., you quickly learn in leadership roles um, that actually if you have to enforce through authority, it's a fairly weak form of leadership. And so actually product turns out to be a good training ground um, for a lot of leadership characteristics um, that you'll need over time even as you build out your career um, and potentially end up going up to be an executive or, or a leader yourself. All right, so this is one of my most controversial, um, and I get feedback on this still to this day. I wrote this post uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, and this represents, uh, I'll call it the death of a dream. Right? So when I worked at eBay, um, eBay at the time for a Web1O company was probably the most 
methodical, quantitative, and rationally driven company I've ever been a part of in software. I mean, I was always familiar with in hardware, like if you looked at the way Intel went through their process of deciding what to manufacture, what designs, the economics down to the penny of the product design for a microprocessor was phenomenal. Software had none of that. Um, but eBay tried to do that. Every feature had a multi-year NPV with agreed upon metrics for how you'd evaluate the value of a feature across the site. Um, they were ruthlessly prioritized. When I left eBay, there was actually a meeting every week where roughly 600 and some odd features were linearly prioritized and kept in order. And as new features were proposed, they were slotted in. You could really have a feature that was like, oh, I think it's 157. Definitely feels like it's in the 150s. Right? <laughs> I know that sounds ridiculous, but I mean, you have to think, eBay had like 15,000 people, amazing amount of code, amazing number of engineers. Um, and the problem is, I don't think it worked. I mean, eBay's a very successful company, so don't get me wrong, to this day, the amount that they push through that site, um, through their applications, the economic value is phenomenal, and, and the benefits they bring to a lot of people who use the site are phenomenal. Um, but as we know, especially if you focus on software, eBay is not perfect on a bunch of different fronts in terms of how they interact with their customers, the experience, and so at LinkedIn, I finally gave up on this idea that you could perfectly linearly prioritize features. And I know this is gonna sound terrible, Mike, for both because every engineer's dream, I know this, I've been on the other side of it, is like, just tell me the list, one through N of the features, and then we'll draw a line where we have enough resources and that's it, done. <laughs> just do that exercise. Um, I haven't found in my experience that that's effective and, and this is why. Um, it turns out I think there's at least three types of features that don't do well prioritized against each other and I'll explain why. And I think focusing on any one of them eventually leads to different forms of failure. So the first type of feature are called metrics movers, right? I don't care what business you're in or what kind of software you have, there are metrics that define whether or not your business is successful. Sometimes it's simple. It could be revenue, profitability, it could be users, it could be engagement. There's some core metric, if you're a startup, that will help you raise the next round. If that's more near and dear to the folks in this room's heart. Um, there are metrics if you're a public company that folks are looking at to understand whether the business is actually going in the direction you expect. No matter where you are, there are metrics. And it turns out most of the brain power at your company, inevitably, because you hire smart people who care about this, they will learn these metrics and they will focus most of their brain power on how to move them up into the right. Uh, and the more successful you get, ironically, you hire more of these people who actually think of new ways to move these things up into the right. Um, and so usually metrics movers dominate all prioritization Discussions. And like I said, eBay was a phenomenal company at this. I have never seen another company in the web who actually did as good a job of prioritizing on a metrics-based, rational way. Um, so what happens when you focus only on metrics movers? Well, it turns out that your customers are talking to you all the time. And they're telling things that they want in the platform, things they hate in the platform, things they love and hate, right? That's what customer service deals with all the time, right? That's what a lot of that communication happens. Um, Unfortunately, it's been my experience that customer requests rarely are the high priority metrics movers, right? Um, you rarely get a customer who's, who's asking for a better viral system, right, if, you're, if your priority is growth. They're, they're, they're really asking for you to have a better subscription platform so you can have more tiers to make more money. And we can go down the list, but it turns out most customer requests will not move your numbers. And I know the idealists will say, well, but yes, but once in a while there is one. I'm telling you, hundreds and hundreds of requests comes in, thousands, and you can become large millions. You have to accept the fact that most customer requests don't actually move the needle. Um, but it turns out if you don't listen to your customers on a regular basis, uh, they don't like you. I mean, think about even your friends, but think about people you know, you give them advice, and they don't listen to you. What do you think of those people? Humans are fairly egotistical. Like, if there's someone who doesn't listen to you on a regular basis, at minimum, you don't like them very. Um, now let me ask you a question. What happens if someone asks for advice, you give it to them, they don't take it, and then they're super successful? Now what do you think of that person? You hate them. <laughs> and this is what I saw happening at eBay, because it turned out eBay is a very complex product. A marketplace is hard to understand. There's literally thousands of categories, different merchandise, billions of dollars. The idea that any customer request knew how to optimize that business was, was almost not. But what happened is eBay was very good at metrics movers. And so what happened is eBay was not listening to its customers. 
and yet the numbers kept going up and to the right. And so it was amazing what happened, that distrust from customers turned into almost conspiracy theory level hatred. Because how could it be possible that a business could be great while not listening to its customers, right? Um, and I, I don't want to sell short shrift. eBay had wonderful teams of people who actually did try to listen to customers. But it was very, very hard to prioritize features in the face of the question of what metric does this move. And so most of those people got frustrated nine out of 10 times. And so what I became a big believer in is that if you always prioritize metrics movers over customer requests and put them in the same queue, you will end up in a pattern where you mostly don't listen to your customers, and they will not like it. If you do regularly respond to your top customer requests, your customers will like it. But there's still a problem, in my view. They won't love you. I mean, they'll like you. You listen to them, you're running a good business. Um, but that irrational emotional love, and now I'm gonna sound a little bit more like an Apple guy, comes from surprising and delighting your customers won't be there. And the danger of that, as many folks have learned, many companies have learned in the last 10 to 15 years, is that as a software company, it's only a matter of time for one of your competitors to go. Right? So one of the things that's most frustrating about people who compete with Apple is they'll look at any product release and say, oh my God, there's so many things wrong with this. Right? There's features that are wrong with this, there's pricing that's wrong with this, there's bugs in here, like et cetera. Why do people still love that? Why do they feel so irrational? And the answer is, is because it turns out that if you have a repeated pattern of delighting your customers, even if it's an imperfect pattern, even if it doesn't happen every product release, but it happens often enough, um, people become emotionally attached. And they will pick you for emotional reasons, even if the lineup on any one feature or any one release and so in my view, the problem with that, of course, is that these delight features uh, rarely move the numbers. And they, by definition, aren't customer requests. And I'll explain why. Um, to me, a delight feature is all about surprise. Tim Cook actually does this really well in interviews. I saw him down at Code a few years ago. And as usual, Kara was asking him all the questions she wants to ask. When's the car coming? When's the TV coming? Name your favorite Apple rumored product, and they'd ask him. You know, Tim, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he says something every time that's like, well, I hope you know that we actually believe that our customers enjoy being surprised. And I think it's such a simple concept, but we forget. People do like being surprised, particularly in software and technology. And that's because there's a belief. I don't want to call it a myth because it comes true sometimes. But there's a, almost an irrational belief that somewhere there are smart people smart designers, smart engineers, brilliant people working on the cutting edge of technology and figuring out new ways to use that technology to make great things, right? And every time you come up with a feature and implement it where a customer looks at it and goes like, I wouldn't have thought of that, but my God, why doesn't everything work that way? It could be a really simple thing. That surprise, though, fills that belief that you are part of the team, your company, that fits that belief. Like, you fit that idealistic view that there's a group of technologists who are super smart and they're coming up with things that can change the way that people do things. And I think that that's so powerful that if you get people to believe in your team, in your company, in your brand, through that product delight, um, you will have an unfair advantage over your competitors. And it will frustrate them terribly. Because they'll want to line things up by features, they'll want to line things up by numbers, and you instead will have cultivated a set of customers who just says, I love this team. I love this company. It's that kind of level of emotional attack. So anyway, um, every time I do this, people go, OK, Adam, I get it. But can we kind of come up with some heuristic where we put 70% on metrics movers, 20% on customer requests, 10% on delight, put that in the spreadsheet, rank it, boom, we're gone. Back to that linear. You know, I don't even think I could stop you if I tried. Like, I know people want to do this. Um, my experience is it's not a productive exercise. And actually, in an agile environment where you're working on lots of little things all the time and iterating evolution, it's so easy. If you're doing sprints, it's so easy to ask the question, when's the last time you did a sprint that focused on customer requests? When's the last time you rolled out a delight feature? Um, I used to have my product managers in product specs on my team towards the end actually put in their product spec which features in this release, especially in mobile, this is important because you tend to do bigger monolithic releases, um, which were the metrics movers, which were the customer requests, and which were the delight features, 
with the implication that if you were zero in any of those buckets, you had a problem. Because the best products cover all three of those. And that doesn't mean that every release has to hit all three, but your relationship with the customer through your product needs to hit all three on a regular basis. And by the way, delight features aren't something that you have to do every week or every month. If you do it right, that magic can happen once or twice a year, and it'll stick emotionally with people. But in my experience, like I said, delight features rarely move the numbers, and by definition, because they involve surprise, are rarely customer requests. Customer requests rarely move the numbers, and usually can't surprise people, so you can't get that delight out of it. Um, and then, of course, methods move, as it turns out, Almost no one wants to hear about. Things that move your business are something that you care a ton about. Your customers don't actually care about them, right? I actually like the exercise. You know, Amazon has product uh, leaders, product managers actually write the press release before they build the product. Press release is a little old school. And blog post is fine. But actually, it's a great exercise because you know what? If you as a product leader write the blog post before you build a thing, what you'll discover is you never blog about metrics work. You tend to only blog about customer requests and delight features. And that's actually one of the clues you have towards whether you're really working on something that your customers will not only like, but will love you for. All right, so um, I have a, you know, my uh, uh, original degree, um, uh, I got in human computer interaction. Um, and so I still have a soft spot for design based thinking. Um, and this is actually one that comes more from the design side. It took me a while. Um, to really get teams comfortable with talking about emotion, right? You can probably see this in the LinkedIn interface now, right? Like, whatever you think of LinkedIn, you probably compare it now to where it was like 10 years ago, and say, oh, at least there's some warmth in this thing. Uh, I can see faces, there's some humanity to it, like it's not just a bunch of resume data. Um, and that was the part of a process of getting people to actually talk about emotion. It turns out a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about emotion. Um, they want to talk about facts and figures, things that are very left brain. Why are people applying for jobs? Why do people not get jobs? Why, how do people pick companies? These are the types of things you talk about at a company like LinkedIn. What they weren't talking about was people's hopes and fears. Right? They weren't talking about when people apply for a job, what are they worried about? You know, they're afraid that someone else has the inside track. They're afraid um, that there's this thing on their resume that they won't understand if they don't get a chance to talk. Right? They're afraid that they'll never get a promotion. They're afraid that their career isn't going where they want it to. They're afraid they're going to hear about it from their parents. I mean, they're just afraid of all these things. But what's positive? Is the, if I get this job, my life will change in some way. Maybe it's better for their family situation. Maybe it's finally the promotion they figured out. Maybe their parents will be proud of them. Maybe, who knows? Like, there's all sorts of things that get tied on the positive side. But it was so hard to get people to talk about it until I made it explicit that you have to talk about strong emotions. Not just positive ones, talk about the negative ones too. Um, we didn't do this enough at eBay. We got better at this at LinkedIn. Um, and so I think in the end, if you're trying to boost engagement, if you're trying to build a product that people really love and engage with, you can either lower friction, dull down the pain, or you can increase desire and kind of boost the positive. But you won't get your teams brainstorming the best ideas or thinking about it if they're not actually thinking about those emotions. So when I say find the heat, heat is my placeholder for any strong emotion, right? To get people out of that kind of left brain activity. Um, and even ask the question, what emotions drive your product? I mean, I was talking earlier before this, there's a lot of excitement in FinTech now around mortgages. I would encourage people to talk about what all the emotions are that go into that process. And what fears and negative emotions are triggered as part of the process? What are the positive parts of the process that aren't triggered? And find ways in your software, whether it's your content, whether it's your design, whether it's the way you order your features, find some way to trigger those positive emotions or amplify them, and dull down the negative ones as early as possible. Uh, even just having this discussion on a regular basis, I found, improves the quality of the design ideas that people have. And quickly you discover it's an easy way to differentiate from incumbent products, or believe me, they're not having those discussions. And they tend to see software as something where there's a list of requirements, and you build to those requirements, and you go to the next round. That human discussion can be an execution advantage. So these next two are going to be sound a little trite, because um, you know, unfortunately with, with Steve Jobs passing away, I think one of the biggest takeaways that people had 
of the Steve Jobs era was talking about simplicity. Uh, and that's good for us because um, we're all, you know, like I said, building new companies, thinking that we're gonna do it better than the companies that came before us. And you know, the canonical example in software is that the first pure software company, Microsoft, gave us Office. And that feature creep and that complication, we still haven't dug out. Right? Like it's still a wonder to behold how many features exist in Microsoft Office that actually have 1% of their users using sometimes and will scream bloody murder if you pull it out. And yet it's just an amazing thing. Right? Like, and like I said, Office is a very successful product, but everyone who's come after has said, well, how do you avoid that level of complexity? And one of the solutions turns out to be to just embrace simplicity as a goal. And we've learned tricks, right? It, it turns out when you switch platforms, you can cut away a lot of features. That's why actually mobile was fantastic. We got to ask real questions like, well, if you only have a screen with one thing to do, kind of like email, what's that one thing? The web kind of killed this a little bit because it felt like, yeah, there's a limit to how much real estate you have on a web page, but clearly you can fit 200 links on that page. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. And so I think, I think we use platform transitions to do it. I think we use new apps and new features. I, I think the language has gotten better in the industry about focusing on a single problem and a, and a, a very specific customer situation. Uh, but it turns out simple is really hard. And there's no other way that I've noticed to actually embrace that if you don't embrace every opportunity to simplify your product. Uh, and the simplicity, of course, actually has gifts. Um, Clay Christensen, um, in his theory about disruption, talks a lot about jobs that your customers hire you to do. And that's a great customer-centric view of the world to understand really who your competition is, but get really focused on what features in your product really are must-have. What are the features that really fit the job that your customers are hiring to do? And which are the accumulation of experiments that turned out to be interesting, but not actually the most important thing that you do? And I think as a product leader, you always have to be asking, what's the most important thing you do? I mean, the most exciting thing to me about right now about the direction that Wealthfront's been taking the last few years is embracing this idea that actually their role with the customers around financial advice, not just managing money, right? Automating all of these pieces that come together that cause people either stress or lead to suboptimal outcomes for people, right? And so asking what's that one job that you do opens up not only room for new features that focus on the customer, um, but the opportunity for simplicity where you cut out features that aren't needed anymore, even if it causes some pain. So every time I talk about simplicity, though, I started noticing that there was a problem. It became almost fetishized to a religious level, right? And so I've added this a few years ago. I wrote this post about Einstein's razor. Uh, how many people have heard of Einstein's razor before here? Occam? A few? Occam's razor. Occam's razor. Yeah, Occam's razor is, is typical. So usually you learn you know, early, whether it's in elementary school or high school, Occam's razor is the principle in science. It's not a law of science, it's just it's a principle that if you have two explanations for something and one that both predict the outcome and one's simpler than the other, it's usually better to go with the simpler one, right? And the reason that works in science, of course, is because it turns out that science is built on a lot of different assumptions and it's less likely that the simple one will get knocked out and ruin all the deductions you made after. Right? Uh, Einstein's razor is a little bit different. Einstein. Um, quit, and you can actually look this up. This isn't one of those quotes that floats around between you know Yogi Berra and you know <laughs> Mark Twain and like twelve other people who are get every single quote. Um, Einstein said something. I'll paraphrase: You should make things as simple as possible, but not simple. Um, and of course, if you look at some of his great work in terms of mathematical equations in physics, um, he was always working to simplify things, but not at the expense of actually predictive results. And so this same thing applies to software design, in, in, in my opinion, that when you are designing something, if you get too focused on simplicity, you can sometimes actually miss the job that your customer is hiring you for, or actually an opportunity to delight your customer. So this is actually a funny slide, and I'm going to have to update it, uh, because of course iPhone 10. Um, but I like to talk about the iPhone, um, uh, not to date myself, but because of how controversial it was. You have to understand that when the iPhone launched in 2007, the best-selling phones, the ones that everyone thought ruled the roost, had already gone past 12 keys, right, with the numeric keypad, and already gone to having a full QWERTY keyboard, or being really clever, maybe half a QWERTY keyboard that you could type with like the BlackBerry Pro, etc. But these were the phones that owned the market, right? So the idea that buttons matter 
seemed clear. Customers had spoken. If anything, it said more were better. Um, and no one, almost no one thought it was reasonable that people would give up a tactile interface by buttons you could feel. And so for Apple to come up with a touch screen at that point just seemed ludicrous. I mean, you, you can check online. The, the, the quotes were unbelievable at the time. Um, and of course, it wasn't cheap either. So an expensive phone with no buttons. It was like, oh, I'm paying so much for just one button. Um, and so I always ask people, though, and, and being, you know, someone came from Apple, like, well, wait, like, why, why did they have one button? You think no one at Apple said, like, you know, we can get rid of all the buttons. Right? We don't have to put that home button at the bottom. It only took them 10 years to do. Um, and that's because they actually decided that as much as that would make things simpler, it was too simple, and it came at the expense of user experience. Because what happens when you get rid of these buttons? You lose that tactile interface, and you introduce modality, right? The fewer choices you have, you have to go deeper in the queue. And so actually, they decided at the time, clearly, even though they were breaking ground with the touch screen and putting it out there in mass market, that the, there were some things that people needed to be able to do without looking at the phone. And the buttons they left, right? You know, the volume up and down, the power button, um, as well as the home button, had the functions that you wanted to be able to do even if you weren't looking at your phone. Right? And that's why they ended up going to one and not zero. Um, now interestingly, of course, they actually added something. And most people have forgotten this too. So at the time, all the best phones, whether they're Nokia phones, Blackberry, etc., if you wanted to silence your phone, it was like general, like, like settings, sound, mute. So it was like three levels deep. And you could do it pretty fast in the Blackberry with the roller effect. But it was still like three levels deep and you had to look at your phone. They actually, despite having gone to all this effort to remove all those buttons, they added not a button, but a switch. So that if your phone was ringing in your pocket, you could reach down and turn it off. And the number of people who were just delighted that this incredibly painful experience in their life was finally solved was just phenomenal. And so I think that's the lesson from Einstein's laser is that, that the price of that simplicity which is usually modality, is also an opportunity to add something that really could delight your customer. If Apple had kept all these buttons, et cetera, there's no doubt there would have been not enough differentiation to really get the ecosystem going. Um, but I always think about that switch and how we all take it for granted now. And that really was a delight feature. And now in retrospect, you kind of say, like, why would, why would you ever build a phone that you couldn't turn off the sound? So this last one I like to talk about because I believe that software is a team sport, and I'm happy to open up to questions. Um, so when I say this, I mean like there are sports out there um, that are individual sports, where most of his practice beating a time, beating a metric, um, it's about you, it's in your mind, it's about perseverance. Um, we all know sports like this. Team sports are different because they usually involve coordination and communication, and actually different skill sets if you really push deeply into it. We all have our favorite team sports where we probably can emphasize this, I believe software is a team sport. I believe there's a real limit to what a single person can actually achieve in software. In fact, I think this is one of the reasons that some of the best software that we think of was actually even written by a couple of people, even if it was just two, right? That this balance of the team. Um, I think every function actually brings something critical and deserves respect. I, I, uh, my experience has been that if you are disparaging of any function, I don't care if it's sales or marketing or service, engineering, design, product, analytics, finance, you name it, it just means you haven't worked with someone exceptional in that role. Um, because they all add immense value um, when they're done well. Uh, and so it's okay, because startups don't have the luxury of having perfect people in every role, and, and by the way, most companies don't, even the large ones. Um, but one of the benefits I've had in my career is that since I've held most of these roles, right, at different companies at different points of time, I can tell you that they all have superpowers. And what I mean by that is that this ability to frame the discussion, to change the discussion, not just to influence the company, um, but actually change its trajectory. I think that superpower exists in every function, if they use it properly. And I mostly have learned this from working with great people at different points in those different functions. So just a couple examples. I mean, this is about product, but product has an amazing power when it's used properly to frame the discussion, right? I mean, we learn this in like algorithms 101, right? Like in school. Right, like how you structure the data says a lot about what algorithms you can use to solve that data and the performance of those algorithms. The same thing applies 
with how you structure a product debate, a strategy debate. How you frame that discussion has a lot to do with what solutions will be obvious to people and which ones won't. Design has an amazing superpower because it turns out most of us can't visualize the options. Even if we think we can, we can visualize a couple and they're usually derivative, right? Like we, we have an analogy to another product that we've seen the design for and we kind of replace the text in our head, right? Designers aren't limited by this and their ability to change the belief of what you should be building, what you could be building with visualization is an incredible superpower. I've seen talented designers change the entire product roadmap just by showing a vision of a different way to think about the product that no one could really wrap their heads around without seeing. And then of course in engineering, I mean we all know the superpower there. How much time is wasted at companies debating whether something is or isn't possible? Or whether it can be built, not built? Engineers have the power to just take this off the table. My favorite, favorite discussion always begins with something like, hey, can I show you something? Like I built this this weekend, all right? <laughs> Um, that ability to play with new technologies, new platforms, I mean, this is one of the reasons I started Hack Days at LinkedIn, was just the ability to change a discussion by showing that there's a debate to be had about whether something should or shouldn't be done, but let's not debate anymore whether it can be done. It's an amazing super In fact, um, little known fact, but in 2015, when there was a huge debate in Washington about the fiduciary rule, um, and there's been some back and forth of the whole thing, my entire point, to lawmakers and regulators was that it's perfectly fine to have a policy debate about whether this rule is a good idea or not. And I think smart people could disagree about that, although I'm pretty biased about it. Um, but let's not debate whether it's technically possible anymore. Right? Like there's enough evidence that that's a solved problem. So you can debate should or shouldn't, um, but don't debate whether it is possible or not. Uh, and I think that's the gift, the superpower that engineers have. And so like there's a superpower for every function. If you don't know what it is, find out um, as you're hiring for those roles. Um, and if you're in one of these roles or find yourself placed in them, make sure you understand what your power is and don't get frustrated um, if you're not using that power to its fullest. It's something that we learn to be excellent in the world. So anyway, I'm gonna open up for questions. Um, I do say that I, I, I'm a big believer, people know this, that um, you know, when we're building software at startups, larger companies, even public companies, we tend to be our hardest stuff hardest critics, right? We, we know every edge, we know every compromise, we know every part that was dreamed up that we couldn't build, every bug that has been found but hasn't been fixed. Um, products are never done, and we're always learning how to build them better. Um, I am a big believer that behaviors matter, that values matter, that the way we built software together matters, um, and how we think about the problem matters. And so I love it that you all came out uh, on a weekday night um, with only a promise of, of pizza and beer. Um, to actually think about, maybe even for an hour, what it means to be a great product leader. And here's some of the lessons that I have from my career. So, thank you everyone. Before we open it up to the floor for questions, I will mention that not only do we have pizza and beer, but our water finally got here. So after this, we'll have some water as well. Uh, but I had just one question, and that was, you talked about the three buckets, the metric movers, the customer delight, um, I'm getting another one off the top of my head, but I'm wondering if you have examples of uh, products or features that you've been at companies that have the companies been at Hatchip, or that you see on the marketplace today that really have been memorable for driving one, two, or all three of those. Yeah, I think, um, and we can quibble about them, because one of the problems with delight features is that very quickly we start taking them for granted, like that emotion sticks, but they become obvious to everyone and then people do them. Um, metrics movers are, are a dime a dozen, really. I, th I think anyone who's worked at a software company, whether they're optimizing for revenue, clicks, eyeballs, growth numbers, virality, like you pick it. Um, we all know like tons of, of measures like that, you know? So like, I mean, eBay, we used to move or change the watch item. I remember when we changed like the watch item link to a button. And that was like a multi-million dollar boost. Like that's how big eBay was, right? Like that you get to a certain scale where you can just move numbers phenomenally. Um, I think that customer requests are what you'd expect, right? They tend to be pain points um, or frustrations or, or opportunities people say to make the product better for them. 
Um, once again, these are actually very common, right? Like, and if you don't have a queue, if you're a product manager, product leader, or you're leading a team, and you don't have that queue from your customer service team, if you don't see the comments on social media, et cetera, um, you should, right? Because very often you'll discover that there's a relatively small number of feature problems. I mean, at Wealthfront, a lot of our worst pain points in customer requests actually had to do with text that people didn't feel was clear or it didn't reflect their expectations. And some, we could just delight people by actually changing the way we frame something or bringing up an issue earlier, um, which might have been counterintuitive, right? Like your simplicity instinct is to cut everything out and less text is better, et cetera. But we actually did very, very well for our customers by actually putting the type of information they wanted to see front, right? You know, for example, one of the questions in the early days of Wealthfront that turned out to be a big question was, why are there so many Vanguard funds, right? And we didn't have anything there because we had some Vanguard funds, but not all, but it turns out they're some of the best index funds out there. Uh, but there was so much of an assumption of, of backroom deals and money that even though Vanguard doesn't do this, people didn't know that, they assumed that we had some deal, like we were getting paid to put people in funds. And so actually putting a link on the page that said, why Vanguard? I don't think it's necessary anymore, but in the early days that actually turned out to be not just a customer request, but we put it out there and people reacted positively to it. Um, delight features are, are a little trickier because like I said, it, it depends what your goal is, the surprise. Um, I remember um, the days where LinkedIn Mobile was, was hard. When I took over LinkedIn Mobile in 2009, we, we had had an early iPhone app, but it was a labor of love by an engineer in their spare time. We had an intern work a little bit on it because less than 1% of our engagement was through the, the app. And you get in that cycle where you don't invest in mobile because the metrics are too small and then it never gets better and then and that was going on. So I remember in the beginning it had to send a message that LinkedIn was doing innovative things on mobile. And so we actually launched the first release that we did when we actually got a team together to the app. It had the ability to exchange business card information, that contact information over Bluetooth, right? And I will tell you 100% of the articles about that or social media posts were so excited about that. And I remember, I think it's safe to talk about this now, it's been like nine years, but if, Jeff, if you're watching this, I hope it's okay. okay. But, um, but it, it was, so everyone got excited about it because people kept talking on social media and all this stuff. Uh, there was even a startup at the time, Bump, that everyone was excited about, and I was like, oh, what are the, they just assumed the metrics were amazing because everyone's talking about this Bluetooth kind of thing the week after launch. And I had to say things like, oh yeah, yeah like, how many did we do yesterday? I'm like, oh, about 60, 60,000? <laughs> It wasn't 60 million, it's like, no, like 63. <laughs> like it was one of these features that everyone wanted to talk about because to them it re represented this future. Right? We're not gonna have business cards, we'll all be wireless. These phones are great, we've got seen, but um, it just, it was, it, people didn't actually use it. Um, my favorite delight feature is actually when you get really to a pain point. Like I, I'm, I'm uh, there's, a, there's a cute little feature on Wealthfront, if you're not a Wealthfront customer, you might not know about it, um, that we've been talking about for years company finally rolled it out last year, but I'd love to see it, which is that it turns out people, a lot of the customers of Wealthfront really love Wealthfront, because it's differentiated. Um, but um, there's this awkward thing, you can't show the product to other people, because you're showing them your money. I mean, I can't tell you how many journalist interviews I did where I had to do this thing where I'm like, okay, you're looking at my Wealthfront account, pretend I'm not showing you my money, let's focus on the feature. It's just really awkward, but, but how, how can you love a product and not show it to people? And so they finally rolled out the feature where if you shake the app, it kind of switches the currency and all the numbers, but all the features stay the same, like the projection. So instead of saying like, oh, you need you know, this much money to retire or you're this far along the path, it, it might flip around to actually you know, saying like you need you know, 100 times as much in yuan or something you know, just different. Um, but it's fun, like people like, like, oh yeah, that's right, like if you wanted to show something, your account, that sort of thing, like why can't you do that? Um, so it can be small things, but like I said, what, to me the importance of delight features is it actually shows your customers that you're, you're, it's not just innovating, that's the wrong word, but that actually you're coming up with things that they wouldn't think of, but then once they see it, they go, that makes sense. And it builds faith in your team and your company um, that you're delivering on that. Frankly, what I think is, like I said, it's not a myth, but that desire people have to believe that smart people are working on problems that make things better for people. So, um, so yeah, that's why I have the three buckets. Awesome, thanks. I, as a Wellfront user and someone who's referred to other people, I love that. But let's, uh, the, the shape feature, let's open up a couple of questions. Uh, if you feel comfortable, shout it out. Otherwise, I'll bring the, uh, the mic around and Adam, feel free to call out folks. Okay, uh, in the back here. Hi, thanks. Um, you spoke earlier about how product managers typically don't have that much control of employees, and they're typically in the organization, maybe 5% of work that others don't. Motivate the teams to actually listen to us and actually get those 
lot of times it's been more wants and desires. What's the motivating currency for the various needs of the public? Yeah, so this is a hard question. Um, so the question asked, just repeating uh, the mic, is, is basically um, how do you get teams to listen to the product manager if, if, if you know, they have this responsibility but they don't have this authority in like techniques? Uh, I just want to clarify one thing I would say is that when I talk about product managers covering that last 5%, it was in the guys that actually, there's that old joke like entering scoping goes, the first 80% will take 80% of the time and then the last 20% will take 80% of the time. <laughs> right? That's kind of the classic software thing. So I wasn't actually implying that's 5% of the work. That, that, that last mile of quality um, is is phenomenal uh, amount of work. Um, but yeah, so I think the techniques, I mean, I, there are some companies that optimize around process. And the answer is you listen to the product manager because there's a process that says you do uncertain questions. So eBay actually had a huge project management organization separate from product management. And the product, the, the project manager had a list of questions. They, they knew which group was responsible for the answer of different questions. Um, but it was a feature related question or a prioritization question. The product manager had to answer it and process enforce that. Uh, I think the problem with using process as a form of leadership is it's not a form of leadership. It's a system. But if people don't agree with the system, your motivation drops, they resist, maybe they don't even obey. Then you're in this awkward place where you're punishing people for not following the system. Um, and, and there's all sorts of ways that dysfunction propagates across engineering. Um, the best way I've seen building product managers and getting people to listen to them is actually has to do with that track record. Right? I think product organizations that are good um, at delivering results um, and having people who deliver results on the team um, they build credibility. Usually it starts with the founder. Um, and that credibility gets shared to new people as they kind of learn. They borrow that credibility in the beginning. And like I said, if you have them show success in the first few months, then they build their own credibility. Right? So it's initially believing the ethos and then driving alongside. Yeah, a lot of it, um, so a lot of it, all those pieces matter, but a lot of it has to do, I think, as a CEO, as a founder, as someone, uh, a product leader, when you bring on new people in product, consider it one of the highest rates of failure for bringing on a new role, right? Like there's some rate of failure, you bring on an engineer, it doesn't work out, you bring on a designer, it doesn't work out. Bringing on a product manager is a very high risk maneuver. And that amount of intentionality of making sure that the early projects you put them on are not only within their skill, but have been thought through enough that there's more of a likelihood of success I mean, you can take a new product manager into an organization and put them on a high-risk experimental project. Um, you just need to know that if the first few things that they get put on don't work out, it may not be recoverable reputation-wise within the company. They may be able to go on to other groups if it's a larger company or to another company. Um, but my experience has been that if you have a product leader who doesn't win games for their team, there's really a limited window before when the team just won't, they won't buy the process I mean, it turns out most people in this industry are, are competitive enough. They believe in the company enough. They want to win. So, that's my best advice there. Yeah, we have time for two more. Two more? Um, sure, here. Oh, nope. I'll get you next. Hi. Okay. Um, so, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I'm new to the learning setup, and I work well on technical tools. I definitely have a mindset that automation is just one thing. Um, recently, I've been working with a lot of people in operations who are don't want to have more standardized their processes, even though cognitively I think we understand that growth is necessary to scale. What are some strategies or advice you have for that? This is a great question. Um, because not only does it hit, I think, a lot of fintech markets in general, um, but also I think it actually hits a lot of customer bases in general. Like a lot of enterprise products die on the vine because they don't realize what they're doing to the actual workflows and people involved. Um, and we have a problem in our industry where we mostly only empathize and understand roles that we and our friends have had. Uh, and that doesn't extend to the incredible breadth of the workforce and what they have. So, um, and I love that you have some, you're working on internal tools. Um, but I think it's important with internal tools that it's not purely an efficiency argument. I always go back to the engineering side on the software side. Um, as a software engineer, I never complained about the build system getting faster or a better checkout method or a faster process um, because in my mind, there was this high value thing I was doing, you know, mostly thinking about architecture and then actual implementation. And then all those other things were actually just kind of in my way to getting it realized. And it can be very easy, especially when people come from traditional industries, um, to not 
have that point of view, right? So, um, and that's because in a lot of industries, those functions aren't, they're not in growth areas of the company. And this is why I think growth is so important. This is not what your VCs want. Um, I'm, I'm sure they do, but it's, it's not just what your VCs want, it's not just what you want as a founder, your employees want, someday the IPO, et cetera. Um, the reason growth helps is because then the discussion becomes, look, we're gonna have five times the value next year. You guys are wasting all your time on stuff that actually you hate. I mean, like, some of the best optimizations that we made at Wealthfront were actually on the back end when we discovered how much time you know, our service people who are really talented. I mean, one of the great things about the Wealthfront model was that, as you said, is when you automate most things, you can actually focus humans on their highest value tasks, right? And, and so um, when you have a whole person who's doing nothing but kind of making sure that, you know, whether it's the wire arrived on time or that this thing is still in process, when you automate that away, not only does that free up the time for that person to do higher value things, and likely more interesting things and more valuable things, um, which should be reflected, by the way, in their compensation. Um, but also it means that you can, it's not just scalability, um, it actually is, is, is a reason why um, you don't have to grow that team in that way. Um, the last thing I'll say about that one, though, is that there are some people, especially in headcount intensive areas, that are used to promotion and advancement in their career only coming from that mass hiring of people who will then be layered under managers and senior managers and directors. And so usually the problem with automation that they're not telling you is that they're actually worried about their career, right? They expected that, oh, I'll be one of the first service people, but when we have 100 people, I'll be one of the managers or directors, et cetera. And by the way, this is true in software too. I mean, one of the first things that, that Microsoft did that I thought was genius in the software world was make it very clear that there was no limit to your promotion or pay potential at Microsoft if you wanted to say a software engineer. Right? You did not have to go and become a general manager. You could actually promote it up. And we take that for granted in software. I mean, Google does it, Facebook does it. Most companies now know you can have a brilliant architect who doesn't run a team, and they, they could still make as much money or more than anyone in the company. Um, but we haven't had the empathy, I think, to extend that out to these other functions. And so you need to, my advice would be to make sure that it isn't a lie. Right? Will automation hurt? or will actually reward those people who will now no longer be able to build up giant teams of hundreds of people, but will be able to do higher and higher value things um, and actually scale the organization and be compensated for it with promotion and title. Um, and so anyway, I think that th those are the techniques I would use. I, I think about the problem. I think there's something real there um, that doesn't always come true for people in service roles and operational roles that we take for granted in engineering and design and product. Okay, I think we have one more question. Yeah, so, so my question was kind of a follow-up. You're saying the importance of when you bring in someone in your product to, to set them up to have kind of a quick, clear, done, critical win. It seems to, to me, as a company, is geared towards uh, focusing on product on things that move metrics versus, uh, because that's like being shown as a clear win, um, versus my pitch for what you're saying was customer requests are things that may be appreciated by customers, but kind of underappreciated publicly or from like a number standpoint and those kind of features that delight, there always seems to be some intuitiveness to delivering on that. Is that kind of a fair way to say it's like, in terms of setting up someone to be successful, to focus on those types of products initially? Um, not necessarily, but I understand, uh, I understand the question. So the question was, if you're trying to set up early product managers or new product managers for success, is that bias towards metrics movers because that's quantifiable? Um, whereas customer requests or delight features might be more debate or it might be more intuitive. Um, the short answer is, um, yes, I do think there's a bias towards metrics movers, but don't underestimate the fact that customer requests and delight features, like I said, are things that you actually write about, that people talk about on social media, that they brag about, right? That, and so um, when I say a win, teams can feel very good for moving the numbers. My experience is that teams feel very good when they have evidence that customers are delighted, right? They, they also uh, feel really good when they know that a customer pain point has been solved, right? And so I don't think the evidence has to be metrics. I think each of those buckets have their own way of rewarding people. I do think delight features are fairly rare. It's hard to give a new person that. Um, although I have seen some success by having people jump on something that's fun like that that the teams wanted to do. 
Because the success is, man, we've been talking about this for five years. We finally shipped it. Like, that's, that's a win by itself. Um, so I think that you're right. There's a bias towards metrics movers. Um, it depends a little bit on the seniority of the person you're hiring as well and what track record they bring in. Right? It's very different bringing in a product manager who may have been an engineer or designer before and this is their first product role or they're out of school. Um, or maybe they were a product manager at a company but it's not a buzzy company that everyone automatically maps to product success. Um, and someone coming in with some significant success at a company that you know, people actually already respect for having great products. Um, and so you can think of it as like a risk tolerance, right? How much risk do you want to take with the new person? Um, uh, has a lot to do with that person, that role, and what area they're jumping into. Uh, but I will tell you, I wrote, uh, as a final note, I did write a post on this that I, I still like to this day, this idea of what you do with a product manager in your first two weeks, first two months, and first two quarters. Um, and the first thing I have product manager do in the first two weeks is to go through the entire existing roadmap with the team and come back with their list of questions about prioritization. It's always a fantastic learning experience. Even for someone who's new out of school, fresh set of eyes, always ends up pointing out, hey, I understand why this is our top two priorities. This third makes no sense to me. I thought we were trying to move this number. Like, why are we doing that? And what you usually discover is either there's something in your onboarding that was broken. Oh, no, you don't understand. Actually, our strategy is this. We actually measure it this way. That's very important for the strategy, and so it improves your onboarding. But I will tell you, at least half the time, what you realize at that point is that you know, we were actually just prioritizing that because we got tired of fighting about it. It's been three years. And that's not actually a really good reason for our customers to prioritize that effort. Um, and so if anyone's interested, that, that kind of two weeks, two months, two quarters, I think is a really useful framework, especially as you start to scale. Um, and as a founder, you might be giving up the product reins to that first hire, that second hire. Um, it's a good thing to think about. I found it was actually effective with executives too. Right, even, even staffing people, vice presidents or above, um, thinking about how people will believe in that leader within the first two weeks, two months, two quarters, turns out to be a useful framework, um, even when the person's incredibly senior and accomplished. Anyway, I'm happy to stay after for one-on-one -on -one questions, but I appreciate everyone staying and, and spending the time. Thanks. <laughs>
uh, talk to me after or connect with me. You can just reach out through Meetup or LinkedIn or however else. And finally, a thanks to our uh, sustaining sponsor, uh, Yodley. Uh, I don't think news here today, but um, they've been super involved in the Meetup coming and, and doing a bunch of other stuff. So thanks to them. And with that, we're done. So thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>
All right, sorry, you were saying that you were doing it with your son? No, no, no. So I take my daughter, I've got girls, I take my daughter to tech events, like trade shows. And then I do, and she does an interview where she'll sit with someone and say, Hi, I'm a lot of and so and and just doesn't roll. And I just hold my phone up with the, the cell phone with the earbuds. So I got a three foot rock shot. And I was trying to expand that into a better camera, and someone suggested I get this thing. So I've had this for about six months, and I'm trying to figure out what it's good for. And it doesn't have reliable So you, I bought this is two separate things. That's the camera, and that's 400 bucks, and then that's the battery pack. I'm sorry, it's 400 bucks. Uh, it's and that's the yeah, battery pack. Yeah, exactly. And the battery pack has an Ethernet cable. So this model is the. I think it overheated. Is what the problem is. It's been running for Feel it. So I think the battery overheated. Um, and that's why the Wi Fi is dying. Anyway, like.